Jake Layton is an internationally known jazz vocalist who lives and teaches in Seattle, Washington. Her style ranges from a cappella duets to instrumental quartets to jazz standards. Her life has always been one of innovation, from loft concerts in New York City to collaborating with other vocal improvisers in an a cappella song group called Vocal Summit. How did a young girl from Youngstown, Ohio, manage to navigate the turbulent waters of the jazz world, motherhood, teaching, performing, and still push her artistry to its edges to remain a free voice? Well, I grew up in Ohio and uh, in a in sort of, a, I guess, second generation Italian family. And there's, there's, of course, there was always music, mostly at Italian weddings and things like that. My mother did sing around the house because she, she probably would have been a professional, professional singer if the times had been right. I mean, it was swing era, I guess, and where you had to sing the kind of music she wanted to sing, the standards, which was the popular music then, wasn't acceptable to her Italian father. And uh, like I say, I went to a lot of Italian weddings, and there was always some kind of a band there. And there was a lot of accordion music, which was actually my first instrument. I won a big accordion, and I didn't play it very long, but I suppose that was my first instrument. Meanwhile, everybody took piano, and, and that included me. And uh, I'm very glad that I took piano, because it paid off later on when I found out that I was a singer. Actually, it was a cappella choir that uh, finally, when I got to high school and was in the a cappella choir, that, that uh, turned me on to New York. Because in, when I was a junior in high school, my, the director uh, motivated us to save up money, you know, and do sales and things to get to New York for four days where we performed in the churches there. Mm. Some people just can't take New York, but my first trip there, it became real clear to me that, that I had to go back. Junior, I think it was my junior year in, in college, I made a summer trip also to New York and, and found out that uh, went started to hear music there and realized that that's where I was destined to go. And then uh, when I graduated from college, I got a, a, a gig up at the uh, Thousand Islands, which is north of New York, between Canada and New York, and um, with the band from college. And that was, I waited tables, and then around 10 o'clock I went off and was changed and went up there and sang. And that was like a steady thing for the summer. That was really fun. And then that's when I made my decision. I had that money and I went and moved right to New York then. I love you. jobs by day that allowed her to pursue singing by night. She spent a lot of time listening to music in classic settings like the Village Vanguard, the Five Spot, and the Half Note, and heard the jazz greats of the time. She learned how to hang out in clubs, waiting for her chance to sit in on a set and sing. Jay and musician Frank Clayton have two children. They used to work together, performing in their loft in Soho, where they invited friend Cecil McBee, Sam Rivers, Joanne Brockeen and Bob Moses to join their jams. Years of dedicated hard work generating gigs for herself and other young unknowns ultimately led to European tours, jazz festivals, and clubs around the United States. Uh, I seemed to, to cross paths with different composers who weren't necessarily jazz composers, one of which was uh, Steve Reich, who um, I guess he kind of found me because he was looking for a jazz singer who could read. And that was my introduction to minimal music, which I found challenging. And still, I perform with Steve Reich. I'm on several of his, several of his pieces. And at that time, it was challenging to sing horn parts. That's what he was looking for. I was doubling horns. And it was a real rhythmical kind of music um, with roots in, in um, uh, 
kind of Eastern music. But I always enjoyed working with horn players and different kinds. It was just coincidence that I worked with my first horn, I guess, was trombone, and now I'm uh, collaborating with Julian Priester, who's also a trombone. Like when I first got to New York, I was doing standards, and then the came. That was the uh, that was the '60s free music time, which and standards are the jazz standards. Jazz standards, standards. Yeah. like you know, they're they from show tunes. It's a whole repertoire, repertoire. that's you know, and rhythm section, and you sing the tune and whatever. And at the same time was this whole movement toward free jazz, where people would just get together and they did it in my loft and they did it in lofts on, in that area, where you just play. Crazy screaming music, all mostly instrumentalists. I mean, Gene Lee was the only other singer doing it. But I would sit there shyly, but then get the nerve to get up and sing. And then I met this Mark Levin, who was a brass player who had a free group, and he invited me to sing. And I really uh, got into it. Um, and so for a while, I didn't sing standards. I left those, and oh, I can't do anything on that, those. So I was just singing free. I, got, I got, actually got a reputation as a more of a free avant-garde singer, you know. But then I would long for the standards. So I had a, many years of trying. I think I finally got it together in the last 10 years. But the first 10 or 15 years were so kind of separate. Now I'll do standards. Now I'll sing free. What, how does this get together? And who is, which one's me? And that was an interesting kind of thing. But I think instrumentalists were doing the same thing. Um, and of course, my attraction to Steve Lacey was that he was one of the first, even though he was doing all but Monk at that time, the next step in his uh, development was he always was into the avant garde or finding your own sound and not necessarily being bound. You were influenced by tradition but not bound by it. That there was new ways that were different people and we want new ways to improvise them.
At that time, I had a vision. It's interesting. I had a vision of what I called a master's, I like master singers or something. I don't know. I wanted to get people like Jean Lee, and it, I, I even knew about Ursula, but but it, I didn't. She wasn't. I didn't know her enough to. Ask. Ursula Duce. Yeah, Ursula Duce. But Jean Lee was definitely doing free singing, and I was, you know, even somebody like Sheila Jordan. I, I had this fantasy that we would all get together sometime in a small group and make some kind of a, a group, a cappella. So I started what I call a voice group, which a lot of it was students, because, you know, there weren't enough singers who had been doing it long enough to really make a master's thing out of it. And then I would have Jean Lee be a guest or whatever. Jay worked with student singers and professionals, but had a hard time putting together a master's group. In 1980, her first album under her own name appeared and included husband Frank on drums, Jane Ira Bloom, Harvey Schwartz, and Larry Karish. Subsequently, in 1982, Joe Barent, noted jazz producer and writer, invited her to a two-week jazz meeting in West Germany. The singers and musicians rehearsed and recorded every single day. I was invited to Germany uh, with uh, Ursula Dudzek and Bobby McFerrin and Lauren Newton and Jean Lee to do a vocal, a sort of, they called it a vocal summit because it was a meeting. And uh, er, the, Joe Barrett every year does this jazz meeting in Baden Baden. And each year it's a different theme. Sometimes it's all clarinets, sometimes it's all basses, and this time it was improvising voices. So out of that came uh, the vocal summit. We used to get together in uh, the hotel room and just sing a cappella, even though there were instrumentalists on this meeting. And uh, of course, I had already had some pieces from the voice group, and uh, the other singers had contributions. And we um, started singing a cappella and finding it became like a forum for what voices could do with a strong jazz influence. And I still do vocal summit today, and Ursula Dujak and I are the nucleus of it. And Oh, <laughs> 
Throughout her musical career, Jay has supported herself as a performer and teacher. She has evolved various methods of teaching that include classical vocal training and her philosophy of being a jazz singer. At present, she teaches at Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. Well, in other words, what I, I think what I do is I sing to them. Mm -hmm. so, you see what I'm saying? It's not like you're just going to look over. So, uh, uh, what did you say? Hello, Susie. Hello. Now I'm talking to them. The night discloses a lot of dust and passing breeze. Filled with memories of the golden something that never needed. So I'm always exploring ways, exercises and things to learn to sing. I feel that singing, to learn to sing, you learn to sing by singing. So the teacher's job is to help you get in situations and help you steer you toward things to sing that will help you learn. And that's what I found through a combination of studying with a classical teacher and just figuring it out myself. I don't think you can teach jazz per se. I still don't. And I don't think I teach jazz. But anybody who's inclined to it, I can certainly teach the repertoire. I can certainly steer you and give you a system whereby if you do these things and you really are a jazz singer or you really do love it and you have and you're talented, you you'll this is what to do is help you, you know, help you along. But there was no real anal analysis of what we were doing. We just did it. You have to learn tunes, there's no question. You gotta learn a lot of tunes. You find out which ones are yours. Some of them aren't yours. You have to be able to know which ones you connect with or not. Um, things that I took for granted I now teach. Like I had to be. Imagine the first time I got up and I had to somebody said, well, what tempo? You had to count off a tempo. Well, I had to learn how to count off a tempo from watching these instrumentals. One, two, you know. And now I can't assume that these young play. They don't. So I teach them. I literally teach them how to count off a tempo, which to me thinks, oh, I, they would know that. But of course, why would they know that? Or what is a ballad? Or what is a swing? What's a blues? You know, how many bars is this? You know, what's a bridge? And basically, I guess my philosophy says is that you work on your, your technical, of course, there's always a technical thing, there's a conceptual thing, and then there's this, the soul part, the part that can, you know, is the expression. And, and like, so for instance, you might hear, one of the things, when you become a teacher, you start to hear a certain thing, say, well, here's a student, you hear what they do, and say, well, and everybody does this, say, well, oh, well, that's great, they have a lot, you might say, they really have a lot of soul, or they, God, I really get feeling from them. And you might say, well, their voice is a little, maybe you can't even hear the soul because the voice is out of tune, or that's the technical part. Or sometimes you feel, wow, that's real individual, or that's really so personal. That's concept, right? She beats me up, who makes you feel shy, who makes you too strong, the bad boy die, try to do the They have a feeling, but like, what is, they're not saying anything. That's, again, it's concept. Is that ideas? Like ideas or, or whatever, like you're portraying something has to get across that's you, that's you connected with the music. The music is a vehicle. Sometimes it's boring, right? It's never boring if it's honest or there's some kind of concept that's hooked up to the person, right? It's
Well, I guess I haven't changed much in terms of I haven't narrowed it down to one thing. Except I do feel that um, when I work with, as a quintet or sextet, like myself with a rhythm section and one or two horns, I can cover just about everything except for the vocal, you know, vo voices thing. But uh, Jerry Grinelli and I have been a nucleus of many combinations, and uh, and most currently our, our collaboration in, in the, the band quartet, uh, Jerry and Julian Schuster and I and Gary Tukar have been working closer and closer together uh, in a quartet that is pretty, uh, con it's a contemporary thing, but we can do a standard, we can do free improvisation, we can work off of something we've written in many combinations. So that's Jay continues to collaborate and record with such musical contemporaries as the String Trio of New York, Stanley Cowell, Denny Goodhue, and the Don Lamphere Sextet. She is a catalyst for new projects, weaving her musical talents into a large tapestry. Her latest solo endeavors include improvising with a digital delay machine and text, as in this Emily Dickinson poem, I'm Nobody. The irony is that you have to be visible to survive. I thought that for the first 10 years. I really swear, I always said, I don't care about being famous. I just want to do this music. Well, the reality steps in. There's nothing really wrong with it, but it's a hard thing to be involved with it. If, you're, if nobody knows who you are, you will not work. But when you're in the public eye, there's a conflict to that, but you have to find your way to get back to it. And the only way to get back to it is to get back to the music, to get off of you off of you, who you are, do you sing good, what do you look like, do you love the music, get back to the music. And, I and what does success mean to you? Well, success means to continue to do it and make a living at it. To do something that you love, you know, uh, and for me, success is making a living at it because if you don't make a living at it, you won't do it as much. So ultimately, it's, it's connected. Again, you can't get away from that. But mostly it's like, do something you love. Really do it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what you're doing is touching them in some way. You're expressing your really true self. And what it does, I think, is it, 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 it um, reminds them of a feeling that they have, maybe. And it's really you. You're not being somebody else or anything, and you're really trying to give. That's pretty sappy in a way, but it's true. I mean, I don't know how else to say that, because somebody can say, oh, I love your voice. That's great. And I like them to love my voice, but that's not the highest compliment. It really isn't. It's when they say, oh, you really move me. Or sometimes somebody comes and they'll, they'll say, I came, this happened the other day, I came to this concert, I was really feeling terrible. And when, after I left, I felt good. It opens somebody up to something. And it really probably opens them up to themselves. You know? And um, I hope that's, you know, 
what's happening here.